welcome to the uh, commission meeting for May 14th. We'll begin with a Pledge of Allegiance with Kirsten leading us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kirsten. I'd like to remind everybody to uh, silence their cell phones if they will and there's meeting documents next to Commissioner Kelly and Robert has a listening device if anyone would like to uh, use those uh, start with routine business item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda move to approve second we have a motion and a second to approve the agenda any questions or additions changes if not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the same. Motion passes four to zero with one absence. Right. Item number two is to approve the county commission minutes of May 7th, 2013. Approve the minutes. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from last week. Any corrections? If not, those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes four to zero again with one absent. Item number three are bills to be paid in the amount of four hundred and fifty nine thousand nine hundred and eighty eight dollars and thirty seven cents. Pay the bills. Second. We have a motion and a second to pay the bills. Anyone have any comments? Commissioner? Mr. Chair, uh, again this week we have five people uh, getting the uh, four hundred and twenty dollar max on their electric bill uh, after eight last week. And I don't think I've ever seen more than two in a previous bill. So this is apparently an issue. Thank you, Mr. Barth. Any other comments? If not, we have a motion and a second to approve the bills. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously 5 to 0. Item number four are reports. A is the Minnehaha County General Fund analysis as of March 31st, 2013. Item B is the Minnehaha County Regional Juvenile Detention Center report for April. Uh, 2013 and item C is the Minnehaha County Auditor's account with the County Treasurer as of April 30th 2013 those reports have been filed in the auditor's office I item 5 is personnel a is a motion to approve the routine action motion to approve second you have to walk fast Jen. I know. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions for Jen this morning if not, we have a motion and a second to approve routine action. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item B is consider a motion to move Chris Greasy, Bridge and Highway Supervisor for the Highway Department from grade 18-2 to grade 18-4, $23.28 per hour, effective January 1st, 2013. Good morning, Commissioners. Jen Oddix from Human Resources. As you know, department heads have the authorization to hire an employee between step one and step four on the pay grade. DJ Boothy, the highway superintendent, is requesting an adjustment for the highway bridge and sign supervisor, Chris Greasy, from step two to step four, backdating to January 2013, based on his qualifications. You've been given a, briefing, given a briefing memo on this matter, and DJ is here, too, if you have any questions for him. Thank you. DJ, would you like to have any comments? Well, maybe you guys have some questions. Okay. We have a motion. I would make a motion to approve it. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, request. Any other questions or concerns? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion unanimously passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Item six or application for abatement. Kyle Helseth. Good morning, Commissioners. Kyle Helseth, Equalization Office. We bring forward this morning five requests for abatements. All of these requests are for the veterans exemption that was granted at the Boards of Equalization. First one is record ID 15119, 2012 taxes payable in the amount of $970.88. The second is uh, record ID 16268 for 2012 property taxes in the amount of $1,297.38. The third is record ID 17423 in the amount of $447.68. The fourth is uh, record ID 78677, 2012 property taxes in the amount of $1,630.08. The last one is a assessment freeze. 
Well, if, I think I uh, act on the first four and the next one's Pam's. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kyle, uh, on those veterans things, they don't have to apply every year, do they, or do they? No, sir, they don't. It's a one time. Thank you. Thank you. Move approval on those four. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve items A through D. Any questions or comments? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passed. Thank you. Good morning, Pam. Good morning. Um, Pam Nelson, the Treasurer's Office. I have one elderly freeze assessment. Um, it's for ID number 24333. It's for $881.23. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions for Pam? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Item number seven notices and requests. Authorize the county auditor to publish a notice to bidders for project MC 1490 DM-13 County Highway 149 Asphalt Profiling and Overlay. DJ Boothy. Good morning, Commissioners. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. Uh, this is to uh, advertise for a mill and overlay project for the four miles uh, from Colton North to the county line. And uh, we're estimating, I think, between $800,000 and $900,000 for the contract price on this depending on the bid climate. So if you have any questions, I can answer them now. Any questions for DJ? If you... I'll make the motion to authorize. Second. We have a second. DJ, if I might, is this going to be a consortium again of purchasing or is this going to be done individually? This will be one single contract, okay. uh, construction contract, and the administration part of it will be done in-house. Okay, very good. Any other comments or questions? We have a motion and a second to approve the or publish the notice. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank, Thank you. There are no planning and zoning notices, and there are no petition for compromise of lien. The next item is opportunity for public comment. If anyone has uh, any comments that they would like to make on any item that is not on the agenda, we'd appreciate uh, or welcome that input now. If not, I don't see anyone moving. I uh, will go to the regular business agenda. <coughs> Regular business item 10 is a public hearing to consider an application for a retail on and off sale malt beverage and South Dakota farm wine from Sioux Falls Campgrounds Incorporated for the Yogi Bear Camp Resort at 26014 478th Avenue in Brandon, South Dakota. And um, Bruce is here today if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask him in regard to this license. Otherwise, the action today is either to approve or deny the license applications. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning. Do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. It's up to you. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Anyone have, have a any, question? Do you have any questions for me? You probably need to give us your name and address. Just sure. To Bruce Eljets. My, my home address is 26004 478th Avenue, Brandon, South Dakota. Thank you, Bruce. No questions for Bruce? Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to. Uh, well, this is a public. It's a public. Hearing. Oh, this is we public. Have opponents and a, yeah. opponents. Is anyone here uh, in favor? Besides Bruce, <laughs> anyone opposed? <clears throat> Evidently not. I'll make my motion to um, approve the um, the application for malt beverage. Talk we have a motion and a second to approve the uh, retail on off sale malt beverage application. And South Dakota farm wine. Yes. And South Dakota. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments or questions? If those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 11 is consider a resolution to establish Minnehaha County Criminal Justice Advisory Committee and authorize the chairman to sign the charter for the Minnehaha County Criminal Justice Advisory Committee. Gerald Benega. Good morning. We've uh, been talking about a uh, Criminal Justice Advisory Committee since the uh, uh, state approved a change, if you will, in uh, the, their f philosophical uh, need to imprison individuals. Uh, we have got most of the details that we need. 
but now we need to uh, start the process to figure out how it affects, frankly, Minnehaha County, our facilities, and looking for alternative ways for us to uh, support the state's initiative and the governor's initiative. Uh, we've asked Craig Anderson to uh, head this committee. Most of you may know Craig. He was going to be here this morning, but uh, had a little uh, conflict with the ladder and the ladder won. So he won't be here this morning. Craig's uh, resume is incredible. Um, I've had this for a while. It frankly is nine pages long. So I'm not just gonna highlight that, but he has uh, many degrees. Uh, he's got a law degree, he's got an MBA, he's got a master's in public accounting, he's a CPA. Uh, he's been the uh, consulting uh, engineer, if you will, of an analytic company. He's been the founder and the director and the board of directors of Prairie Wave. He's the president, was the past president of McLeod's. He's the past president of Dakota Telecommunications Group, or DTG as we know it. He's been a vice president and chief financial officer and the general counsel and the corporate secretary for Austeds. He was the director and the vice president of uh, Dialnet. Uh, he was the director and senior vice president and legal advisor to a company called the Zond Group. And he also has a legal practice and he also consults, if you will, with uh, the Catholic Diocese. He's got an incredible resume. Uh, some of us have got to know him really well. He's obviously someone who has a lot of interest in supporting public uh, safety, if you will. And uh, we're thrilled that he would dedicate his time and efforts to make that happen. We have a resolution that's been passed out to you. I don't know that we need to read it uh, unless the commission decides that they would like to do that. Any input? Any questions? Uh, we have support, if you will, in the audience. Michelle, would you like to make any comments about the initiative or the the whole process that we'll, we'll be starting in the next uh, few weeks? Um, we too would like to thank him for his dedication to this project. Um, there's a lot of unknowns with this, so we want to make sure that we move forward in the best way possible, and I think involving the community in our efforts is about the best way we can go. So we're just here to help support that and um, thank you the commission as well for their support. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else have any comments? Um, currently, I am the liaison with the uh, uh, Sheriff's Department and Commissioner Kelly was also involved with it over the last couple of years. So the two of us will be on the commission. Obviously, Craig Anderson will be the uh, chair of the advisory committee. Uh, Robert Wilson is going to be a, an ex-official staff person and, and help us with the support. Uh, we also have a small budget for some of the travel and expenses that we may incur, and we will appoint additional members as we go. Uh, Craig has already talked about uh, task force members that have asked to be part of the group, and they will be appointed for special task and special uh, responsibilities as we move forward. So uh, we don't have a time frame put together, but we will do this as expeditiously as possible, but still uh, make sure that the public is made aware of what's going on on a regular basis. Other questions, Commissioner? I, I would just comment that I think this is the right thing to do. Uh, you know, our facilities are reaching capacity as well as becoming more uh, outdated at all times. and. We're faced with uh, some other changes with the, the governor's criminal justice initiative, which, although I'm extremely hopeful about, I'm also have my little fears in the background. So, having this type of uh, committee looking at what we need in this county, I think, is a great idea. Thank you. Any other comments, Commissioner Kelly? Well, you know, a lot of this evolves around the correction center, but it's going to be broader than that. But we have an opportunity now with uh, with our former warden going to the to the penitentiary and we've got good relationship with the people up in the Department of uh, Corrections and Peer uh, I think the state's on board with with helping us so I think we can work together Craig I can't think of a better chairman uh, I was delighted when he agreed to do it absolutely other comments 
If not, I think we need a motion to approve the so uh, resolution and the uh, charter, if you will, and the appointment of Craig as the chairperson. And I'd also like to include uh, myself and Commissioner Kelly as members of the group. Reiterate my motion and support. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll I'll second. second. <clears throat> a motion and a second. Any comments or concerns, questions from the audience? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Good. Item number 12 is authorized chairman to sign jail inmate housing contract between Minnehaha County and Lincoln County. Jeff Palmer. We're just requesting to renew the contract with Lincoln County. We currently contract with Lincoln County for 12 beds every day of the year. Um, the only real change in the contract would be a slight increase in the daily rate from 75.92 to 78.69. Um, the contract would be written to expire on June 30th, which puts it in line with the rest of our contract. We're going to have to have you identify yourself. I'm sorry. And give Jeff. us your name. We know who you are. <laughs> Jeff Grover. I'm the warden at the jail. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for but Jeff? Commissioner just a comment, Jeff. I want to commend you on making a slight increase because I think too often we just approve these at the last year's rate and then all of a sudden we get caught. And uh, I think. Small adjustments along the way will keep it in line with what our costs actually are. So. Well, and the increase matches the increase from the, pre the other 16 contracts that was filed last year. This date now puts the contract expiration date the same as the other counties, so we'll have them all on the same cycle. Thank you. Any other questions for Jeff? Make a motion to authorize the chair to sign it. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the contract between Minnehaha County and Lincoln County. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 13 is final consideration of Minnehaha County Petitioner Gatherers, Gatherers Policy Committee Report and Recommendations. Erin Serska. Good morning. Erin uh, Serska acting as chair of the Petition Gatherers Committee. Uh, and just to remind everyone of last week, we had great turnout at our meeting. Uh, all of the committee members and members of the public were there. Everyone agreed how important petition gathering is uh, to our community and in our governmental process. And the recommendation is to keep the policy as is. Uh, the discussion pretty much revolved around the item of the policy where petitioners were to stand in inclement weather. And there are a few options that the committee came to to offer to the commission. It's recommended to keep it uh, as is with allowing one individual to stand in the breezeway during inclement weather uh, with petitioners rotating which one gets to stand in the breezeway at, at different times. This has worked in the past and the uh, committee members present and the community members present agreed that that was a viable option. Uh, the other options include in inclement weather to uh, allow petitioners to stand right inside the doorway uh, they, we also had an option of building a shelter right outside of the building, similar to that of a bus stop, or construct a new, more open entrance. Uh, some of the disadvantages of the building uh, is the cost. However, uh, by building, you, you offer less congestion in that, in that doorway. Uh, so those are our options, and we look forward to the Commission's uh, consideration of our recommendations. Thank you, Erin, and thank you for serving on that committee along with Commissioner Barth and Commissioner Heiberger, so we appreciate your input. Anyone have any questions for Commissioner Kelly? Erin, this the committee's uh, recommendation will not allow them inside the, inside the administration building, though, is that correct? Uh, the only recommendation that does is option two, and that's instead of having the one petitioner stand in that breezeway in yeah. the doorway, is to have them stand directly just inside the doorway. Which is the current policy. The current policy is to have them uh, stand right inside the doorway, at one at a time. Just for clarification, Commissioner, the current policy as it stands right now is that folks need to be outside of the building. However, in inclement weather, and that we can allow a person, to, one person to stand in that breezeway, 
and that uh, uh, that's how it stands right now in that entryway. The option two that um, Aaron was referring to, that instead of the breezeway, you could potentially allow them to step right inside the administration building, typically by the directory, uh, right across you know where the bathrooms are. I mean, inside, physically inside the building, and. I believe the committee recommendation was really to keep the policy as it is right now. That was their number one. Um, but which would be option one? Correct. Right. <coughs> Any Commissioner Heiberger? Just ha just a comment. And sure. um, the meeting went very well. It wasn't very long. We all had an opportunity to express our opinions, and we had some outside people too, not just um, not just the commission and, and Aaron. There was other people on the committee. Um, no, I forgot what I was going to mention. <laughs> I'll have to think about it. Oh, I do know what it is. Sorry, okay. I had to get back to it. Um, with the moving of the driver's license people down on Kiwanis and Russell, I feel like the congestion is going to be less because we'll have a lot of people that used to be here on a daily basis not here anymore. And so um, the congestion issue, I think, will decrease. And the only time we're looking at that is if we're gathering petitions in the winter, which isn't real frequent. So. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Barth? Well, I would just call our attention to uh, the options, which include uh, constructing a, a shelter similar to a bus stop on the exterior there and making a, a new and more open entrance. The fact is that this is the busiest entrance to our building. The east entrance is gloriously uh, constructed to allow massive numbers to come in, but uh, the parking lot is on the other side of the building. So everybody comes in that small door and uh, the, the door may be legally uh, wide enough for uh, handicap access but uh, it's not very easy and if anyone has pushed people through uh, uh, doors uh, on a wheelchair, uh, you know, you're, you're put, the door is trying to close the, uh, the bar in the middle between the doors, I, I would like a wider entrance there one way or the other. I recognize that there are some costs, but I'm not unwilling to at least examine uh, those those costs. And if we had a glassed-in area on the outside, like a bus stop type thing, there would be shelter from wind and from uh, rain. I, I, and I don't think it would hurt the uh, appearance of the building. Anyway, uh, this is an option. Uh, perhaps we can talk about it at uh, a future time, maybe in the building committee. But I, I think that Right now, it's not very easy to get through with handicapped people. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other questions for Aaron? Mm -hmm. No? Uh, we'd certainly like input or comments from the audience if they wish. Otherwise, we will. Uh, no one moving? Good morning. Good morning, Teresa Staley, Sioux Falls. And um, I agree with. Commissioner Barth that that having been down here with the Snowgate petition drive that that doorway needs to be widened and actually after we had that last task force meeting some, several of us went down and looked at the areas there's restrooms on the side and it'd be neat if they could come in and widen that whole foyer out so that there is more passageway allowed but at the end of the day you know we, we've had are a surge of petitioning here. We just had a referendum happen. These people got signatures, worked so hard, and they got over 6,000 signatures in less than, I think it was two weeks. I mean, that is, that is fabulous. I can tell you, having been out there, that, is, that shows you that people are willing to get in and participate. And those people from the Shape Sioux Falls thing told me, we will never look at a petitioner the same way. I would challenge each one of you to get out there sometime and hold a petition. You will see it from this side of the fence at that time. It's a fabulous thing for our community. Spellerberg, Snowgates, now we're going to have Shape Sioux Falls on the ballot. This is activism at its best. So common sense needs to prevail here. I would like to see this group of people it, doing things to encourage that instead of spitting in our face at times and saying, you know, we're, we're, this is a hassle because people are asking us to sign a petition. No, this is fabulous. We need to encourage it. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll just make this a warm embrace to the public. Thank you. Other comments? Hi, I'm Bruce Danielson. Uh, I was here for the meeting with Jeff Barth and Cindy and 
the uh, uh, I really want to stress the the ADA aspect of it. Having a disabled family member and having watched the disabled people going through that entrance, and the entrance needs to be get rid of that center uh, mailbox unit. People are standing there. Also, while all these people in their wheelchairs or their walkers are going in and out. I just watched somebody come in the door here a few minutes ago when I was coming in. And it's difficult. And it's not smooth anymore. The, a lot of these modern wheelchairs have small wheels on them that can't get over the hump very easily. They're motorized or they get pushed. So there's a lot of aspects of those 50-year-old doors that need to go. And the easiest way having watched people actually waiting for their bus ride to come and everything else, they're standing there by the door waiting for somebody to come, and they're blocking the entrance. So it isn't just the petitioners or the, uh, it's people who are waiting for their rides, it's people that are, that are disabled, they're all standing there or riding in their wheelchairs waiting to get through. So having had to deal a lot with ADA, I see that that is, probably your biggest legal hurdle for that entrance. And it's not allowing people, oh, if you're disabled, go to this door or that door. They have to go to the door that everybody else goes to. There isn't a segregation aspect here. It's ADA is equality. And having done the snow gates and been involved in petition drives, I can go from that one. Teresa covered it very well. But I just want to stress the ADA aspect of it. And thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Any other comments? Well, I was on board for a little while. <laughs> I don't know what mailbox he's talking about, but if he's talking about my drop box for property taxes, that'd be a big problem. Oh, can, can I answer that? I would like to see that included in a new entrance aspect. I mean, that's not a problem. I totally agree because I use that mailbox. And thousands of people do. Yeah, so exactly. if you're thinking about getting rid of it, then I'm not no, on board here. Bruce, just a second. We have to have one at a time at the okay. microphone, so I'm so we'll wait a second. So my concern was if the mailbox he's talking about is my drop box that people drop off their property taxes and stuff, then I have a problem with that because thousands and thousands of people use it. And that would be an issue. Thank you, Pam. Questions? Yeah. Commissioner Heiberger? Just a comment. I believe that we are compliant with ADA standards and I realize it can be some issues and I appreciate your comments and stuff we have a 50 year old building that you know that can be looked at in the future but we are compliant with ADA oh, standards. It, it, it's it's it, it meets minimum standards I, I, I agree with that it's a 36 inch door and and the other parts that go with it and I agree with that and I'm, and I'm sorry Pam for interrupting <laughs> you but I, I forgot about I wanted to mention you know the importance of that box mm -hmm. and with just a slightly enlarged entry you know outside the building if that if the cost could be looked into to have a something out there that that allows people to have that gathering area that's right now being used at the bottom of the steps or in the foyer you know that's what I was asking about thank you morning Ken commissioners I'd just like to reiterate and that um, I think the issue at hand is, does our current petition policy as it stands right now, does that accommodate both the wishes of the petition gatherers and their need to, for access to the public and our need to, con, you know, to have unfettered access as well into the building? And, and, and whole, I think it does. I think our current policy accomplishes those goals and I would not recommend any change to that policy and I would recommend that you reiterate that that is the current policy as will be followed. The issues of expanding the doorways and that and some of these other structural issues, I think those are absolutely worthy of discussion and exploration, but I don't think those issues right now should cloud does our current policy meet the needs of uh, both the petition gatherers and our need to have unfettered access into the building. And that, so we can certainly look at those things and incorporate uh, and look at costs and see what it would do for future entries to the building as part of your capital improvement schedule. And I would, I would urge you in, to consider, you know, to stick with the policy right now. And that, and so. 
Thank you. Any other comments, questions, Commissioner Kelly? Well, I agree with Ken that you know we what I, I'm not happy with number one, but it's better than <laughs> any other options. But I do think we have an obligation to to look at that entrance. It's not a convenient entrance by any stretch, and uh, uh, I think today people are expecting the automatic doors anyway, and and I, I think we should seriously look at it before budget time. And see how we can fit that into 2014 or 15. Then. Thank you. Any other comments, Commissioner Heiberger? I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure we have an automatic door there for we do accessible entrance. Yeah. Commissioner Heiberger. I'm just ready to make a motion. Any other comments? Otherwise, we'll go with the motion. Commissioner Heiberger. I'd like to make the leave leave the policy as stands. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Any other questions? Commissioner Barth? I just would uh, you know, also accept the work of the committee uh, uh, being a member of it. I suppose that's heading myself a little bit. Uh, we have a number of folks here that came, and I, I appreciate their attendance. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Commissioner Beckus, yeah, and I just want to reiterate that the Minneapolis County Commission does recognize the fact that there is a constitutional right to petition and that we are going to acknowledge that right. And if anything, this entrance situation that was brought before the commission is incidental uh, to, uh, unfortunately, the process of gathering petition signatures. Thank you. Any other comments? not we have a motion and a second to approve which is option one yeah. to leave it as is let's do a roll call vote please Commissioner Barth aye Heiberger yes Kelly aye Pecas aye Benica yes motion unanimously passes five to zero thank you item number 14 is consider a motion to reappoint Kim Ringer to the Siouxland Library Board of Directors Gerald Benega uh, Kim has been a very active uh, member of the Siouxland Library's Board of Directors. She has fulfilled her first term and uh, she would like to serve again a second term and I would recommend that she be reappointed for her last term. I'd make that motion to reappoint. Second. Uh, a motion or and a second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Motion unanimously passes. Before we go to item 15, I wanted to thank Aaron for your leadership and putting yes. that committee together. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your extra efforts. Thank you. Item 15. Item 15 is consider resolutions to compromise various categories of county aid liens in accordance with county policy. Bob Litz. Good morning, Commission. Bob Litz from the Auditor's Office, and uh, this is our annual lien cleanup policy. The current policy is to cancel the following categories of county aid liens annually. Liens of more than $30,000, reduced to $30,000. I think that was a courtesy of Commissioner Barth here a couple of years ago. Liens on deceased persons with uh, reduced to zero. And what we do is we wait one year unless we have verified the estate has no assets. And that list has been reviewed by Human Services. Third part would be liens with no activity for 30 years, reduced to zero. And fourth is liens under $250 with no activity for 10 years, reduced to zero. And the fifth is the uh, liens identified as uncollectible. They're deceased, transient, social security income, homeless, or no resources. They'd be reduced to zero, too. This list has been compiled by Human Services. I request that you approve the attached resolutions, which will cancel the liens that have been uh, identified in these categories. If you wish to see the details, list of the liens to be canceled, please let me know, and I'll bring them. Uh, the attached chart shows the history of our annual lien cleanups and the increasing balance of liens owed to the county. Uh, requesting that you would uh, you would sign the uh, resolutions today. Thank you, Bob. Any questions of Mr. Litz? Mr. Ryberger. Just a comment. This will clean up 266 liens for a total of three hundred and sixty-four thousand four hundred ninety-two dollars and sixty-one cents. I don't believe that's the right number. Is it's that right? a huge number. Oh. Okay. I'm looking at the wrong thing then. Um, <laughs> Seven hundred twenty-two thousand five hundred and fifty-one and seventeen cents. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's not a problem. Um, I think the thing that is amazing to me is even with the cleanup of these liens, we still have 
what, 20, almost $27 million? Pardon? 57, 57, 57 million. 57 million. Of lien still outstanding in the uh, budget process, which who knows if we'll collect any of it. It's a significant number that count, the county is responsible for that never receives any revenue for the services provided. So. Well, and I'd also like to add that since 1991, we've uh, we've forgiven over 21.7 million dollars. We have a need for a motion, Commissioner. I'll Bart? make a motion to do that, but I have a question okay. for the auditor. Uh, is there a second? second. A second. We have a um, motion and a second, Commissioner Barth. Auditor Bob, is there anything we can do additionally to try to collect some of these monies? You know, if there was, I, I'm not aware of what it is. And, uh, you know, I looked the situation over when we first got here. We, were, we talked a lot with Deb down there. And um, according to state law, we'd have to change some state laws to go after folks. And I, I, I don't have a good answer for you, Commissioner. Call some guys from New York to come and help. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may. Sure, Commissioner Pecos. You know, uh, Government, unfortunately, you hear the uh, uh, genre that government needs to be run more effectively like a business. There is not a business that would be successfully in operation that could sustain the kind of deficit and the debt that we carry. Uh, and that's by state law. We're required to provide these bare minimum services for what was affectionately called the poorest of the poor. And that's a responsibility. A business would not choose to do that. And that's why government, unfortunately, takes the trappings of a business unit, but is not run like a business unit. Uh, we would not make these investments if we did not have to by law. So, you know, I always hear about the fact that we run these amounts and we have this debt, but uh, the reality is that, uh, you know, you hear on our, our city side of the house that, uh, you know, we have to have, you know, a strong business model. And unfortunately, we wouldn't succeed if this was a business model because of state law. And so um, uh, that's why uh, I think government needs to be run as government and not as uh, necessarily the cold, hard uh, business model that many people champion. Um, it just doesn't work that way. And if you want to change it, get elected, go to peer, change the statutes, just as Auditor Bob indicated. Commissioner Kelly. Bob, do we have any idea what percentage of the tr of the $57 million are public defense costs? Uh, I couldn't stand up here and tell you that today, but if you'd like me to research that, we'd uh, certainly be willing to do that. But would it take a part. great deal of research to find out? I, so I don't know the answer to that either. Okay. Up here. Maybe Mr. Peckis has that. I, I do believe it was running about $17 million, I think, and that is a pittance compared to the hospital liens that we have. I would say it's about 25% of what we have compared to hospital liens that we have. Okay. So Thank it's, you. Not, it's not criminal defense costs. It's our two major hospital systems that are dealing with providing health uh, services for individuals that do not have health insurance. Any comment, other comments or questions, commissioners? Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, yes, I'd like to follow up on uh, Commissioner Peckis's comments about the, the nature of government. And, uh, you know, the nature of government is to provide services, of course. And if we ran it on a business model, that would also mean we have profit, meaning it would cost more. And I just don't think those who advocate for that type of position really have thought that through. <laughs> right. Any other comments? We have did a make mo a motion, so uh, we do have a motion a and a second. Is that for all three or four uh, We can have one motion, as I've been told, for all of items A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. That was my uh, my motion. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, those in favor of approving. Uh, item 15, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you, Commissioners. Item number 16 is a briefing from Minnehaha County Auditor on establishment of a capital accumulation fund. Bob Litz. Still Bob Litz from the Auditor's Office. Uh, I'm bringing this uh, forward here again. We talked about it a few years ago here, uh, the idea of uh, accumulating some funds for uh, restricted purposes, and, uh, but we didn't have any money to accumulate at that time. And uh, I would tell you today that the, uh, the county position is a little bit better than the last time I brought this up. But uh, 
Uh, you know, there's a, it's been previously discussed by the commission the idea that the county accumulate funds for capital purposes. And there have been some departments discussing future infrastructure needs and the methods to obtain funding to do so. The idea that we do not have a methodical process for keeping up with the depreciation of our capital investments is also a concern. Uh, just to demonstrate how much depreciation we experience in a year, I've assembled the following. And uh, the total of the 2012 depreciation was $4.7 million. And uh, uh, out of that there, I've got listed buildings, land improvements, equipment general fund, equipment highway fund, equipment other funds, and infrastructure highway. And I chose to leave the bottom three off uh, in compiling my numbers. Uh, simply because uh, those are different revenue st sources. And, and I also want to say that these numbers are kind of some raw numbers. And we can go through this budget and say, well, you know, so-and-so got a new chair. Doesn't that count? Uh, you know, the IT department, highway. There's, there's all sorts of things to parse on this, but I, I just want to put forth the bigger numbers here today. Uh, the first three items are what the building fund helps ameliorate the depreciation of those those items total 2.2 million and those are the focus of my discussion today the other depreciation items have various means of slowing or limiting depreciation outside the general fund or within department budgets below shows the actual amounts and expenditures for 2012 the total of the building fund in 2012 is 3.8 uh, total bond redemption uh, with the cash we spent and uh, the uh, the cost of the services for the banking industry and those who are uh, in that game was 3.6, leaving the capital improvements we spent at one one hundred ninety one thousand five hundred twenty eight dollars and twenty one cents, which typically, if you go back, is is a lower amount. We've spent more. We certainly spent more, and uh, I would encourage that if that that amounts are there. Uh, the total depreciation of 2.2 2.2 .2, 2 million 272 thousand 159 dollars. Uh, if you subtract the uh, building fund expenditures of $191,000, we come up with uh, a little over $2 million with a gap in the investment. And uh, there is a way to help offset the gap in uh, this investment uh, versus depreciation. It's called the Capital Accumulation Fund Balance, as it's outlined in South Dakota Code uh, 7-21-51. The statute outlines the general concepts and conditions of the account. Uh, some of the considerations that are brought forward would uh, the first one would be a resolution would be required to establish an assigned fund balance. Second thing, uh, main thing would be requirements for additions to the account would need to be established. And then uh, third one would be conditions under which the expenditures could be made and would, and then you need to outline that and decide on what you want to spend the money for. And some of that's outlined in the, uh, in the uh, uh, statute that I provided. And for this discussion, I have included the statute that outlines the availability for capital outlay accumulations. Uh, second, the 2012 budget balances. Uh, third, the 2012 budgeted reserves or revenues ver versus actual revenues, and uh, the 2012 assigned uh, or unassigned and undesignated fund balances that would actually be available for this type of thing. Uh, and when considering these uh, these amounts, especially the unassigned, undesignated fund balances, uh, if the commission decides to support this notion, we'll need to put together a resolution. And I would also remind you that. Uh, uh, you know, we were trying to build up our cash in these last couple of years, and it looks like we're kind of getting over to that place where Mr. McFarland will no longer have a heart attack when we talk about budgets. <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm open to uh, any any uh, questions here or any ideas for this here. And you know, I would also say this that that, that basically what we're what we're kind of looking at here with these big numbers is is a, is a philosophical shift that I, I brought to the auditor's office. Now there are those who believe that uh, when you are collecting tax dollars, you spend all, all them down as close as you can get every year. And I understand that, but I also think that uh, we've had a shift in the philosophy here, and, and I'd like to bring forward the notion that it is good stewardship of the public's money to set aside some money, and uh, it, it, it would also uh, probably improve our bond rating as we went forward if we had a little bit of a, uh, a backup fund here. But, you know, how much and what to do with that money is, is entirely up to this commission if you support this notion. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, for well, Bob, we're... Effectively saying we're going to fund depreciation, is that you kind could, of where, where it's coming that. from? I'd like to point out in 72151, uh, there's a phrase in there that Kirsten probably would like, and it says, includes any purpose which is extraordinary in nature. And that is a safety valve that would allow you, if you're low on cash at that point, you can do a lot of things with it. It's up to you as a commission, but you're going to have to talk about it before you do it. And you also need 60% of the governing body to agree on it, on whatever is brought forward. Yeah, and well, we, if, if we did that, would we then... We'd pay the bond redemption out of that fund. You effectively, you certainly could, or you could and put it into the, the the building fund that does repairs and, and upgrades around the, the. And that does the bond redemption. 
Yes. And this would be major things. It would not be chairs and uh, no, tables. It would be highways and it would be buildings and it would be... Well, I'd, I'd like to stay out of the highway fund and stay in the general fund. For well, you purposes. have the same issue over in the highway. You just have the different budget to yes. work with. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, exactly. But I, I agree that, that if, if you do that, build up that fund, you don't get stuck with big tax increases down the road when you have major projects come on. And, I, I just feel that it'd be prudent for us to do so, but I'd like to point out that uh, you know we take uh, you, you, the U.S. the Commission would decide how much money you put in there every year, and at the end of 84 months, which is five years, then you're going to have to look at that total amount. If you've not spent it at that point, it will take a resolution every year to keep that going. Commissioner Peckis, thank you. And I guess uh, in my time I've been on the commission, we have been adjusting from what I'll say affectionately back in the 90s was the county funding source fire sale, which uh, the um, uh, legislature gave away effective funding sources for the county. It's amazing. We've had many different city councilors uh, come and serve on the commission, and they're always dismayed at the financial structure that we have at the county because, quite frankly, we're paupers. We get a dollar, we spend a dollar. And there has been literally uh, 20 years of that taking place here at the county. And if there is some big funding issue that has to take place, the only option we have is to run for an opt-out because we operate on we get a dollar, we spend a dollar. We're paupers. And uh, ultimately, this does bring us up to having the financial acumen to try to save a little money so we can get out of what happened back in the 90s. And uh, I don't want to go into a history lesson because, as Commissioner Benning always says, history is history. But uh, there is a reason why we've had this system set up the way it was. And this does take some small steps forward to try to correct that. So I'm going to support it. Any other comments? Commissioner Barth? Well, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, we, anytime we collect more taxes than we need, uh, the public has an objection to it. And, uh, the idea that uh, our philosophy has been to uh, uh, spend every cent, it's, it's really not to spend every cent is our philosophy. Right. And uh, uh, getting those cents has been tough, uh, as Commissioner Peck has pointed out. Uh, the idea of having a, some kind of a reserve towards our uh, many projects uh, going in the future, uh, it'd be nice, but I, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, this county is probably gaining 5,000 new citizens a year when you count the city and, and the rural areas. These things cost money. And, uh, you know, by the end of this century, we could be 800,000 people in Minnehaha County. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, we've got to prepare for the future, and it doesn't mean we set aside a reserve. It means we go full blast towards the future, and uh, it would be nice to have a reserve. Commissioner Peck. Kelly? Um, there's two issues. One, you've got funding depreciation, which pays for your capital outlay and your and your replacement cost. Uh, the second one is a, I'll call it rainy day fund, which is, I believe, separate from this because that is a fund that you need to have. So if we go through another 209 to 211 issue, we can maintain the services we have with a reserve by dipping into that reserve. Uh, in critical times. This allows us a stability in taxes, I think, that over the years, when we have to replace that building, or, and you know, this building's a good example. I mean, if they'd have funded depreciation in this building 40 years ago, whatever it was built 50 years ago, um, you know, there'd be money there. I understand there's some stipulations on the state, but the fact remains, if, if, if you ever go to do a building like this, or we, you know, what we faced in the court or the jail, uh, that's a big chunk of change. And the less you have to borrow, the, the better it is, and you just keep your taxes level. It does mean initially that there is what appears to be a, a slush fund, or a, mm -hmm. uh, and you know that's an old political debate as to do you spend reserves down or do you hold those reserves for when you when you run into tough times and you know I think it's important we have a fiduciary responsibility not for just the taxes this year but for the taxes in 10 years too and uh, this would be a good way to approach it 
Any other comments before I make a couple? Uh, I think we're you're um, philosophically talking about two different issues. Frankly, you cannot use uh, some of these funds and just call them cash reserves for general uh, operating costs. Uh, there isn't such a thing as a cash reserve for op the uh, operating of the budget. In fact, I think that's legally unpermitted, if you will. The other issue is, is you can't use um, this for making bond payments, as I understand it. And I'm pretty sure I'm right because I've talked to the auditor about that. So I think you need to get back to the whole philosophical need that we have as funding on a capital accumulation fund, which is earmarked only for capital projects or significant investments, if you will. Um, so that, that money is going to be used for capital um, investments or replacements. Uh, the general fund does not have a reserve, won't have a reserve, and you can't use this for a reserve. So that is, I think, legally the way you need to look at this. I also think that from my perspective, when we started to talk about this, we also had a philosophical conversation about unapplied cash and the 5% allowance issue of uh, our requirement to set up a bad debt reserve, if you will, for people who didn't pay their taxes. Unfortunately, I think in some cases we assume that we we're going to get too much uh, unapplied cash used for general operating accounts. That led us into a big problem with cash flow. When we change that philosophy where the, uh, I'll call it the unapplied cash, which is really cash reserves, and the 5% allowance were similar, we frankly were able to accumulate a little more cash because at one point last year, we didn't have enough cash to pay the monthly operating costs. And that's also the reason why we refunded one of the bonds uh, whatever it was over a year ago. So there's a big difference between those two reserve conversations, uh, the general fund issue, and the whole issue of um, unapplied cash versus I'll call the bad debts uh, accumulation. All of that to me needs to be part of the whole conversation about the budget when we get to budget time. I agree with most of the comments that were said just a few minutes ago, but I will remind everybody that part, not part of, a big problem that we have in funding county government is public safety and, and the associated cost with that grow at somewhere between 12 and 15 percent a year for the county. And we have a limit of 1 to 2 percent in property tax revenue that doesn't come anywhere close to funding that cost of uh, us doing business. So there's a philosophical problem with the fact that uh, we're limited on resources, but we're not limited on our responsibilities to pay for public safety. That's the philosophical problem that we have with funding government. And this will help with some capital investments, if you will, but it will not help us with any of the general fund issues that we currently are faced with. If I'm wrong, I hope Ken or somebody, Darlene, will stand up and tell me I am. But, okay, thank you. That's one time in 2013 I've been right. <laughs> Mark it down. Mark it down, yeah. <laughs> but I really feel very strongly that this has to be part of the total process. This is not a one-time philosophical change. This is something that is going to help us with capital issues, not general fund issues or making bond payments. I think, again, that's legally impossible. So thank you for making the presentation. It gives us the seed, if you will, to start the conversation to eventually have a resolution that will show how we could use this. But it does need to be, quote, earmarked for uh, specific needs, correct? Yeah. May I? Uh, absolutely. Okay. I'd love to have your comment. Just the two points that I'd like I like to make just quickly looking at the statute, um, and I know um, 
Bob commented that that phrase from the statute I pay particular attention to any purpose which is of extraordinary in nature I, I'm a little concerned that from the uh, wording of the statute that that purpose need be set out in the initial resolution and so to access those funds just to be clear that would be for that purpose from the get-go that was established the second thing is the 84 month uh, time period that's uh, outlaid in the statute I just want uh, everyone to be clear and correct me if I'm wrong but I believe that all funds that are accumulated from day one from dollar one must all be cleared out within 84 months is that correct um, it was explained to us by the uh, the auditors that from the state that at that that fifth year if we wanted to roll it over and keep that cash in there up to five million dollars that we would have to do it by resolution that year for that year and every year subsequently so their explanation to you was that it could be rolled further along past yes, 84 but, months yes but you're limited to the cap on your five million dollars was my understanding Gerald, was that uh, your recollection of our conversation? Because it certainly was mine. I think we're going to have to uh, I, clarification on that because I know where Kirsten's coming from right now. Uh, there's a difference between what you accumulate in years one through five versus, frankly, what you're going to use it for in year seven. So I think from what we're talking about two different things, you may, in fact, take that first year's uh, pledge if you will and you can carry that forward for five years but I don't believe that you can go through and carry it any longer than seven months for that first year's Eight, seven years. The first year's investment so it's kind of a roll forward kind of thing um, so there's a difference between accumulation of those assets and frankly the revenue that's set aside on an annual basis up to a certain period of time. And the reason I mention that is just so everyone's clear, that is a bucket that I believe is dedicated for a specific purpose and must be spent within a particular period of time if you do elect to do that, just so everyone's aware of that. For us to get to $5 million quickly will be darn near impossible anyway, so. Um, well, question then, to fund buildings, you really, you can't do that under the current statutes. I mean, you talk of 20 or 40 year uh, reserves, but things like carpet, cars, uh, anything that's replaced within five years or has a usable life of five years, and I think we addressed this a little bit on the carpet in the last budget year, did we not? Um, we can have we can have an if we fund that depreciation we have that money available so when you have to do twenty five thousand dollars worth of carpet in here the money's there it does not have to be dragged out of a current budget so much as it's available at the, am I hearing that correct I just caution if I may chair yep. um, that it needs to be a purpose that's extraordinary in nature and I'm there's no real case law interpreting that term I'd be worried of something routine mm -hmm. maintenance and upkeep would not be designated to fall within that mm -hmm. within well, that say, yeah. area. Well, what I'm thinking of, uh, the generator and the backup generator, they're gone. They didn't work. That happened to us a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. So that to me would be an extraordinary situation when we have a campus, including the courthouse, that is, and the jail, which is unfortunately starving of power. So. I think, uh, would that suffice for an extraordinary expenditure? I, I think that's certainly more yeah, arguable okay. than carpet. Again, I think this is a preliminary conversation. I think that we need to have more black and white identification of the auditor's opinion and the legal opinions that we can use just to make sure that we have everything covered. We also have purchasing policies that talk about the amount that we can spend that's operational cost versus a capital cost. So all of that needs to be included in the conversation because when you get to extraordinary purchases, uh, we need to define that a little better. Commissioner Kelly. Well, we have a kind of a lull here for a period of about five or six weeks and then we get into budget. I, I would hope that we could have this conversation just prior to the budget so that, I mean, I think every year we've talked a little bit about it and you kind of kick it down to next year. Because once we get into the budget, it's a little hard. It, it, if you have the facts on this thing, 
the legal and the auditor facts and, the, and what state law allows, we can address that or begin to address it this budget year instead of delaying it a little bit more. I think it would be important to be able to start on this thing at least this year. Well, it is, but I will tell you that the reason it got kicked down the road forever is because you didn't have any cash to kick. That's right. right. Poppers. Yep. You could kick this forever because it was never going to come up. Now it has come up, and we have the ability to set some policies to, to address it. So. And that's the right time to start. Absolutely. Yeah. Commissioner Heiberger? I was actually going to say the opposite. I think it needs to be right after we approve the budget, and I think there's kind of a lull at that point, too, that we can look at something like this. At least if we're aware of the situation, we can move forward. Mr. Chair? I, I also see issues with it because I don't see us having anything extra when we get done with our budget. You know, the best time to have planted a tree is 20 years ago. The best time to have been saving $5 million was five years ago, but we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it five years ago. The second and, best uh, time is Right today. now, we've got enough building projects. I mean, if we save $5 million for the JDC and save $5 million for the highway department, save $5 million for the jail, and a couple of million dollars for the collection facility, that would be great. But we didn't, and we don't have it. Yeah. So if let's say we decide to, you know, build two more floors on our jail next year, it'd be nice to have five million dollars saved up. But we're not going to save five million dollars by t this time next year. So I think uh, let's plan on a reserve and forget about funding it. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> I think we would all have a problem with that, Jeff. Um, <laughs> the deal is, is at this point, it is just a conversation, and it's been yeah. good conversation, uh, but there has to be more extensive information provided so that we can come up with a policy that is mm -hmm. workable and makes enough sense for us to be somewhat flexible but still meet the guidelines that the auditor and the attorney are going to give us. So. Um, and at this point, uh, whether we do it before or after the budget um, probably isn't as big a deal as the fact that we have the conversation and get the process rolling. So any other comments? Mr. Chair, may Mr. I make Litz. a suggestion? Yes. Uh, the state auditors are planning on being out of here Friday. And uh, I was wondering if it would be a good idea if perhaps the chair, uh, our, our legal counsel, and, and somebody from the auditor's office uh, just had a, a powwow and, and kind of got some of these ideas everybody on this on the same track is um, We all see the color green a little bit differently, and I think that maybe yeah. we're all on the same track But uh, we need some clarification. I, I would uh, I would think that'd be a good idea Well, we can have the conversation, but I will tell you from my experience uh, the conversation is good But I want something in writing <laughs> And I don't know that we'll get that by Friday We can get the you know the legislative uh, response quickly because it's in law so to speak in an opinion but the auditor is probably going to want to take some yes. time to look at it also I'm guessing well then uh, then uh, I, I would gather from this here is uh, I would simply wait and confer with perhaps you the chair as to the next appropriate time to bring this subject forward I think we can ask the um, auditor right now for an, a written opinion in the next few weeks before we start the budget process. That would come out of peer, though, not out of the people in that room. Uh, it? He would probably have an opinion, but I'm guessing he's going <laughs> to ask his supervisors before that goes into writing. Right. Correct. Thank you for your uh, getting this process started, and uh, we'll look forward to continuing the conversation at budget time. Thanks for your time, Commissioners. Item 17. Item 17, Minnehaha County Commissioner Liaison Reports. It, Commissioner Heiberger. I have one. It's very short. Good. Just that we had some boiler problems out of the JDC, so we'll be selling, seeing a bill come through that in the next couple of weeks, I believe it was under $1,200. turned out to be less than we expected in the beginning. Oh, so. that's good news. Mm -hmm. Any other liaison reports this morning? I'll be gone next week. Thank you. Uh, any new business? Any old business? Ken. Just very quickly, uh, uh, tomorrow, and that we start with the partner counties and the JDC Advisory Board are, are kicking off their uh, preliminary 
planning session with perspective as far as taking a look at the JDC as it relates to the JDAI initiative. So we'll be kicking off that process and we're making inroads to about JDAI into Lincoln County and our partner counties. Uh, we've got meetings set up here within the next couple of weeks to facilitate that grant as well. Oh, thank you. Any questions for Ken on that? It's a great program, obviously. If not, we need to go to an executive session for pending litigation, legal briefing, personnel, and contract negotiations. Make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second to go into executive sessions for those reasons. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes unanimously. Let's take about a